Welcome back. So welcome back. Just a reminder. Can we please just put our cell phones on silent? We know you've made your calls during the break. We can just put them on silent. And we are ready to start with our first panel of the day, which is the private sector actors, enablers of state capture. I'm going to hand over to Togo, who's going to facilitate this panel. Togo. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back from the comfort break. I just want to remind you about our duck, um, <coughs> Duckworth Lewis. So for those of us on stage, we can see that uh, Duckworth is cracked. And uh, Lindy Wei told me that um, we don't throw away cracked or broken ducks. We put them back together and keep them. Uh, I think this is true of uh, our country, our public administration, everything we've been through. We can't just throw it away, you know? We can't just throw the whole thing away. We have to put it back together and figure out how we move on. So good morning and welcome to this first panel. My name is Togozani Chilenga Butao. I'm a research associate at uh, PARI and a lecturer at Wits University. This morning, we'll be unpacking whether private sector actors were enablers of state capture. According to some of the findings of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, state capture in the South African context evolved as a project by which a relatively small group of actors, together with their network of collaborators, inside and outside of the state conspired systematically to redirect resources from the state for their own gain. Private sector actors were integral to the process of redirecting these state resources, mainly through public procurement, specifically through the assistance of professional service providers in the private sphere, such as advisors, auditors, legal and consulting firms. Some of the consequences of these actions have been felt more abroad than here in South Africa, as we recently witnessed when Bain and company were banned from doing business with the UK government for the next three years, precisely because of their role in state capture here. How do we prevent private actors from taking advantage of state resources in future and thereby prevent opportunities for the private sector to participate in state capture? We have four panelists, two online and two in person. Online, we have Cass Kavudia, who is the CEO of BUSA and a leader figure in organized business. He was the managing director of the Banking Association for South Africa for 15 years. He is also the chairperson of the National Business Initiative on the WITS Council and a member of numerous other boards. We have Michael Marchant here with us on stage, who is the head of investigations at Open Secrets, a nonprofit organization which exposes and builds accountability for private sector economic crimes through investigative research, advocacy, and the law. Michael was the lead researcher on the famous publication, Apartheid Guns and Money, A Tale of Profit. Also online, we have Gugu McLaren Ushewokunze, who also, sorry, who joins us online and is the head of economic yeah, inclusion yeah. at the National Business Initiative. She has more than 14 years experience in the field of social and sustainable development having worked across a range of sectors uh, a range of sectors with the bulk of her career within the corporate sector driving the development and implementation of sustainable development strategies and finally also in person with us we have Kaya Sutole a chartered accountant at Koruska he is an academic activist researcher radio broadcaster and writer 
So we'll start with Cass Kabudia online, asking the question um, about how do we prevent private sector actors from taking advantage of state resources in future? Is Cass with us? Yeah, I am. I am. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay, you may go ahead. You have okay. 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you for the opportunity and, and sincere apologies for not joining uh, in person. I had every intention to do so, but diary is just caught up, unfortunately. Uh, so the question is, how do we avoid private sector participation in corruption and state capture in the future? Let me start by acknowledging, uh, as the Zondo report uh, is quite clearly states, that state capture and corruption more broadly uh, happens when the public and private sector or, or actors in the public and private sector call to allow it to happen and to make it happen. So, so while we are quite vocal in holding government to account, as we must, because government works with taxpayers' money, has a particular responsibility to account for that money and to ensure that taxpayers' money, a uh, significant amount of which goes towards delivery of services and, and other functions of state that are meant to improve the lives of people. The state has a particular responsibility and a particular accountability, and, and we need to hold the state to account. But having said that, quite clearly, the private sector, uh, some of some firms of which have been mentioned in the Zondo report, and the report says that. Uh, these firms should be investigated. And if there's a prima facie case that they were uh, involved in corruption or state capture, they should be prosecuted. Uh, we as BUSA have said that the recommendation that the Zondo Commission makes in that regard must be followed through. And private sector firms that have been mentioned uh, should be investigated. And if there is a prima facie case, they should be prosecuted. Uh, but the Zondo report also, in our view, uh, creates an opportunity for the private sector, particularly through organized business formations, to reflect and to introspect. Because what we now need to concentrate on is what can organized business do to uh, limit uh, whether we'll totally obliterate uh, private sector involvement in corruption uh, is something that we can talk about. But to severely limit uh, private sector involvement in corruption. Now, this can't, it's very difficult for this to happen on a firm by firm basis uh, if the systemic issues that lead to corruption are not dealt with. So, if uh, there are still issues and weaknesses in government uh, that are not addressed, as Zondo says, they should be addressed. And there are still sectors of government that are bent on corruption and uh, find private sector firms to actually corrupt with. Uh, and that becomes a way of doing business or getting business. Uh, that makes it difficult for individual firms to respond in a way that says that we will not participate in this uh, because it is unethical. Uh, but if their competitor is willing to participate in that, then the firm loses business and, and 
over a period of time, it has a neg significantly negative impact on the firm that wants to do the right thing. So I think organized business needs to then put into place guardrails, put into place mechanisms uh, that say quite clearly that we will not tolerate in our membership any firms that are found to be unethical and that are found to be attempting to or actually undertaking, uh, uh, be it with government or be it in the way they do their business. Uh, unethical practices, corrupt activities, state capture, uh, and any other sorts of activities that bring uh, uh, disrepute to business organizations. We are at Busar looking at this, and the complication is that Many of these organizations, like BUSA, are voluntary bodies. Uh, my members do not need to belong to BUSA. They belong to BUSA because they believe that BUSA has a critical role to play in enabling them to do business in a responsible way. But we're talking to a number of people who have experience in this, and to see one, whether we can develop a code of practice uh, that, that uh, with the participation of all our members, that make it incumbent upon members to actually conduct their business in a particular way, in an ethical way. But a code of practice is only useful and is only meaningful if there are mechanisms to sanction members who do not abide by that code. And what we are looking at is whether we can, again, with the participation and, and agreement of all members, uh, put into place some sort of guardrails that say that this is the way we expect members to, con to, to behave. And if members go outside of these guardrails. Obviously, we put into place processes to see why that has happened and speak to members and so on. But if it becomes quite clear that a member deliberately went outside of the guardrails to act in an unethical way or a corrupt way or so, then even though we are a voluntary body, we should have the wherewithal to suspend members and in the event of investigation showing that uh, members deliberately acted in a particular way to 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 uh, uh, ask them to actually lead to to uh, 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 ensure that they are no longer members of the association, and and so that's one of the things that we're looking at currently. The other is to uh, uh, ensure that if firms in the private sector do behave in a way that it became, becomes quite clear that we have not learned the lessons of the last 15 odd years or 10 odd years, then we should be able to call them out publicly. Uh, and, and, and we should be able to show as organized business that uh, certainly an organization like BUSA uh, will not tolerate behavior of that sort in the private sector. Uh, we cannot criticize government or any other players if uh, our own members behave in a particular way and we are unable to actually criticize them and act against them. Uh, the other aspect we're looking at, uh, we've had a couple of meetings with the Whistleblower House. Uh, they've now given us a comprehensive budget uh, uh, we believe that the Whistleblower House is a good organization that can coordinate support for whistleblowers. Uh, I am pulling some of my uh, larger members together to meet with the Whistleblower House and to see if we can raise the necessary resources to support them, uh, because uh, that's another recommendation in Zondo. Uh, to see how we support whistleblowers uh, and protect them. 
and 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 we will be meeting again with the whistleblower house in the next couple of weeks to see if we can assist in that regard. Um, then I think that you know we we have, we've also started a discussion just more broadly on how should we as business conduct ourselves in a manner that is for want of a better term, sustainable. Now, sustainable, not just from the point of view of ensuring we don't degrade the environment uh, from the point of view of climate change issues, energy issues, but also from the point of view of how we interact with our stakeholders. And our stakeholders are no longer just shareholders, are no longer just uh, 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 our customers are no longer just our employees. We have a broader range of stakeholders. Amongst our stakeholders are communities in which we work, uh, 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 markets that we still are developing for the future. And, and I've been reading a book called Reimagining Capitalism. Uh, by a lady called Barbara Solomon from Harvard University, who heads up a unit named Reimagining Capital. And she talks very interestingly about, and she actually, by example, talks about the businesses that have started moving in this direction of conducting ourselves in ways that uh, uh, have a positive impact on communities in which we work, have a positive impact on the environment, uh, uh, have a positive impact on, on uh, uh, our customers, uh, uh, work in a way that we treat staff and employees fairly. And she demonstrates how that sort of business practice is complementary to profit and growth and not contrary to profit and growth if we do it properly. And I think that's a discussion we need to have in South Africa as well amongst the business community. And we started that sort of a discussion. Um, so those are the sorts of, that's the sort of thinking that's happening at the moment. Uh, and and we certainly believe that the Zondo Commission report uh, is a, a, a uh, an opportunity and and uh, for us to actually speed up and accelerate these discussions and come to some decisions fairly quickly and show results from that. We also believe that uh, the Rondo Commission report is an inflection point for all of society in that to a certain extent or to, to a fairly large extent, as all of society, we seem to have lost our moral compass. If one looks at, uh, it's not just bad practice in business and in government, uh, all parts of society, be it the labor movement, be it NGOs, just the way we, be, we conduct ourselves with each other, uh, we've lost our moral compass and this is an opportunity to find that center again. And, and as business, we need to play a role in doing that. Uh, so that's the thinking at the moment. Uh, that's what we're working on. And, and we will accelerate the work on this and, and intend to show some results from all of this work and begin to implement all of this very soon. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for those opening remarks. Uh, Michael, as you well know, the relationship between state and the private sector clearly didn't begin uh, during the state capture years. So from your vantage uh, point, how do you think we can prevent um, the private sector from being enablers of state capture? Uh, sorry. Thanks very much, uh, Toko, and thanks very much everyone here and for the invitation to to participate. It's very nice to be seeing many of you for the first time in, in many years. It's nice to be in the same room. So what I wanted to do in the time available to me today, uh, I, I wanted to make some preliminary observations about the way we frame, I think, the role of the private sector in state capture, how we understand or how we can understand, I think, slightly 
the diff slightly different role of different actors in the private sector. And I wanted to just develop uh, off something that uh, the keynote speaker Terence Nombembe and, and uh, some of the questions from the floor raised this morning in that framing. And then after I've done that, I really just wanted to focus in on, on two things. The one is I wanted to reflect on how I, or I'll use the royal we for open secrets in many instances, kind of how we saw the Zondo Commission treat private sector actors and where we saw the kind of what we would call the hits and the misses, where we thought the Zonda Commission really got it right and gave us something that was really helpful, and where we felt some of the analysis was missing. Um, and then from that, to kind of finish off the discussion with what I think is the, the major point of today is where we go to from here in terms of accountability and addressing that system, which, Toko, I think that was your question. Just from a framing perspective, you know, the name of the panel is uh, Private Sector Enablers of State Capture. Um, and I only really kind of clicked this morning that you could probably remove the question mark from the title of the panel. I think the Zonda Commission and, and many people, you know, many in civil society and the media before that have established that that is absolutely the case. Um, the, the word enablers is a word that Open Secrets has used very often to describe private sector actors. One of the possible dangers sometimes is that it, it can begin to set those actors apart and almost view them not as participants. And in a sense, we should remember that we use the term enablers, particularly to describe the professional firms, the lawyers, the, the consultants, the accountants, etc. But in many instances, those actors and the large multinational corporations that were involved in the procurement side of things were willing and very active participants. And in many instances, we wouldn't see their participation any differently from the other actors. And so maybe just to keep in mind as we discuss it today that there were large multinational firms directly taking part in the corruption at the procurement level. Companies like T-Systems, the Chinese rail companies, those are the two single largest corporate beneficiaries of state capture, as was shown to us by Paul Holden's effort evidence to the Zondo Commission right at the end. Um, so we have those kind of participants at that level. And then we do have the kind of systemic professionalized enabling um, of, uh, of state capture through the banks, the consultants, the auditors, etc. The last thing from a framing point of view that, that I wanted to say and, and pick up from the, the, the issue that was just raised now is that I think one of the dangers when it comes to talking about the private sector versus the public sector is that we don't attribute, uh, Mr. Nombeme, that, is, that, that greed perspective to the private sector. And what we often do is say, well, there was greed at the procurement level and obviously those in the public sector, but there's a risk that we say, well, the private sector actors were playing the game. And we already heard that in a sense from that first uh, contribution, which is, well, firms were saying, if we don't do it, someone else will and we'll lose business. But I think we should just be, you know, absolutely straight up. The, the firms that played a role in state capture in South Africa didn't need those contracts for survival. And in most instances, they knowingly took those contracts on to extract huge profit. And I don't know what we call that if it isn't greed, right? McKinsey would not have stopped working if it didn't, uh, if it didn't uh, secure the ESCOM contract. We know that because it paid the money back when it was eventually found out, right? And so I think, we, you know, I, I really like that lens. And I think we should just remember to, you know, to attribute it to everyone kind of in the ecosystem, which I think is quite helpful. So then just moving on to the issue of how the Zonda Commission treated uh, the, the private sector, I think that the word that we would, would have for it is, is inconsistent. Um, and this was potentially for us a kind of inevitable outcome of the different reports focusing on different institutions and different sets of procurement matters. But what we had, for example, particularly early on in the first couple of reports, is we had very, very strong findings about, about PwC's role at SAA, for example. We had very strong findings against Nedbank's role in interest rate swaps at airports company South Africa. Um, and we had very, very uh, serious findings against the role of Bain in, um, in gutting the South African Revenue Service. And when we looked at that, we thought, well, this is, this is great because there's a, there's a very clear focus and those actors are not going to, they're not going to get away with it. What we see then later is we see some missed opportunities in terms of raising similar actors in later reports, which would have allowed for a more systemic um, account of the role. So, for example, uh, and Kai, I'm kind of treading on your territory in terms of the accountants and the auditors, but there was no real attempt to really discuss the role of Deloitte, for example, at ESCOM, uh, or some the role of, of KPMG 
you know, at a range of institutions, but maybe more particularly how we could then look at each of the role of PwC, um, KPMG and Deloitte and say, well, actually, maybe there's a systemic problem at the big four audit firms and in terms of how they're regulated. And with the exception of the money flows chapter that came at the end of the Zondo Commission, we didn't have uh, we didn't have many instances of, of a coherent attempt to address sectors of the private sector, the law firms, the consultants, the auditors, etc. And and for us, that was a that was a slightly missed missed opportunity. I think that the probably the most obvious example of this was really on on the role of the banks in terms of some of the questions that were left and so you know from our perspective it was very clear many years ago and this was evidence given to the zonda commission right up front that there had been a fundamental failure of the anti-money laundering systems in south africa and again in the keynote address this morning it was raised that this was happening at different parts of the ecosystem uh, so we had banks who may or may not, but largely probably were issuing suspicious activity reports to the FIC, the Reserve Bank, other regulators. That was then going to law enforcement and possibly, well, possibly going to law enforcement and then being stalled at that juncture. I think one of the big missed opportunities for us from the Commission's point of view was that the banks were never called to publicly be interrogated on what was happening within that system. So it, it may well have been that the banks were going to come and say, no, you know, when it came to Estina, we submitted 2000 suspicious activity reports over a matter of six months. No one ever acted on it. And therefore, that's us. But I think at the very least, in the case of Estina, for example, Standard Bank and FNB should have been called publicly to answer questions on why they would facilitate such obviously suspicious transactions from a free state agricultural department into a, an account for 24 hours and then being paid out to Dubai. One of the, the I th we certainly think the great powers of the commission was in the public nature of the hearings. And I think back in particular to those around South African Airways, the infamous Yake Quinana uh, fat cakes interview. What that interview did was revealed the, the sheer absurdity of the system that had existed. And I think it, it, is a, it is in a sense a pity that some of those absurdities were not drawn out in public settings from actors such as, as, as the banks. In, in the case of PwC and SAA, that did happen publicly, but it didn't happen to a lot of the, the other firms. So then moving on, and I, I hope I do have a couple of minutes four minutes okay fantastic time is all right um so just moving on to what we think are the the major issues kind of looking forward in terms of a, a, accountability um and and how we do it because of course that's the that's the really difficult question and it, it's difficult because we don't have a session today uh, we don't have a session at this conference on law enforcement and of course we've spoken this morning about how there was no finding specifically about the nature of law enforcement but we can't avoid that discussion particularly when it comes to the private sector actors because i think first and foremost we'd want to see prosecutions where it's possible and so i think there's overwhelming evidence of of the corruption that happened at places like transnet prasa escom etc the real test i think is going to be whether the private sector actors who are involved are going to be on those indictments so we've seen some very exciting arrests for example around transnet over the last year uh, as it relates to the um, the funding of the transnet 1064 locomotives deal one of the really great tests of law enforcement is going to be Nedbank has been implicated in their role in those uh, those transactions and of course McKinsey has been implicated in terms of their role in the business case for 1064 and a range of other places so are we going to see those those private sector actors on the indictment the reality is and I think we do have to be frank with ourselves and acknowledge the global reality here is that prosecutions of corporate actors are notoriously difficult and global experience tells us that they're incredibly difficult um, to do and so that leads us to this question that's been floating around for a few years now and I think we should really collectively be grappling with what to do with it is what about settlement agreements and deferred prosecution agreements because this is something that the MPA have raised specifically regarding powerful private sector actors uh, and the Zonda Commission raised this issue as, as well 
you know, from our perspective at Open Secrets, we've always been, or we have been, particularly since it's been raised, quite skeptical of the of the proposal. And one of the reasons, of course, is that the global experience tells us about some of the shortcomings and the risks of deferred prosecution agreements and settlement settlement agreements. I mean, nowhere is this more obvious than the, in the role of HSBC in laundering the funds of, of state capture for the Gupta enterprise. You know, HSBC ha was actually subject to a deferred prosecution agreement at the time for its role in money laundering. And HSBC now has a decades long systemic problem with laundering funds for drug cartels and others. And the evidence that the Zondo Commission, and this is in the, the money flows chapter of the commission, finds that HSBC was not just, of course, laundering funds for the Gupta enterprise, but that the Gupta enterprise funds were, were entering a much larger money laundering system that HSBC accounts, particularly in Hong Kong and other places, uh, were running. And so the, the continued or the repetitive um, engagement in that type of conduct goes to show some of the drawbacks about set of settlement agreements and deferred prosecution agreements. Having said that, it may well be, given the incredible difficulty of prosecuting private actors, that this is, this is going to be one of the only tools in the tool shed of law enforcement. And so I think that brings up how do we do it? How can we do it differently? You know, some of the things that we've suggested are that, you know, it's obviously urgent that policy at the level of the MPA and potentially legislative policies introduced to regulate what settlement agreements and deferred prosecutions would look like. One of the key areas is that they must be fully transparent, that they must be partnered with prosecutions of executives where that evidence exists, um, and introducing stronger and harsher monetary uh, penalties for companies that engage in that conduct. I think one of the, the ways they can, of course, be of great assistance, and we've seen this elsewhere in the, in the world, is that given the resource constraints for law enforcement, that potentially those settlement agreements can feed back into resourcing uh, law enforcement in order to pursue those cases. And so, although I certainly come with a, with skepticism for those agreements, if they are going to be pursued, one of the things I think we're going to have to engage with very seriously is, is what is what they look like. And then the, the other things really, I think, have been mentioned to a certain extent already, but it's going to be focusing on the professional bodies, particularly for the private enablers, um, and how to how to address those and how to ensure that they have greater powers of investigation and sanction for those actors that are involved. Um, Kai, you and I have spoken about this many, many times, but until very recently, the Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors had a monetary sanction level uh, limit of 250,000 Rand. So it didn't matter, for example, if PwC's auditors engaged in systemic audit failure over six years at South African Airways, you could only charge them 250,000 Rand um, per charge. Obviously, for a senior auditor and its firm that will carry those, that is not a disincentive to conduct. And so unless SICA, Erba, and other professional bodies, the law societies as well, take action against errant professionals who are enablers of state capture, um, that's not going to change. And then the, the final thing I'll just mention very briefly is that it's, it's so interesting, of course, that there's been this flurry of activity around our potential grey listing uh, by the FATF that is arguably imminent, given our failures around money laundering. And although there are legislative amendments now being brought at the, at the last hour and being debated about adding more uh, professional actors as reporting bodies, etc., the elephant in the room, of course, returns to this question of law enforcement, right, which is that we're not going to be able to address uh, the anti-money laundering system um, unless we can address law enforcement's capacity to act on very complex financial crimes. The, you know, the one downside about the ongoing debate around the FATF grey listing is that it's often being discussed in very narrow terms in terms of its impact on the economy, in terms of investment, etc. But we should reframe the debate because state capture in South Africa was possible because of the system of money laundering, right? The Gupta's ability to move their funds effortlessly into Dubai and Hong Kong really buttressed the system. And that's had devastating social consequences for in South Africa. And so addressing the money laundering issue uh, and the role of private actors is not a, it's not only a technical issue, it's a massive social cost issue. And I think framing it like that and broadening that debate also kind of help us, I think, reprioritize and, and broaden the conversation. Thank you. And I think your comments uh, go back to the keynote address and issues of transactions. So we can see very clearly 
what, who, when, how, why. The question is how do we uh, enforce the law when it comes to um, dealing with state capture. Let's go to Google online. Is she ready? Hi, I'm here. Welcome. Thank you so much, Tokozani. Good morning to, to the panelists, um, including my NBI chairperson, Cass, and all the attendees online and in person. It's a real pleasure to be joining you virtually from Harare this morning. And I'm really pleased to be able to share some of the insights and learnings from an MBI perspective in the work that we do around building trust and accountability that focuses on ethical leadership and anti-corruption. I think the previous panelists have kind of outlined, you know, the, the question around private sector as an enabler of state capture. Um, and certainly I think that that was clear in um, the reports. Uh, and what I want to do is to provide maybe a broader lens around corruption within the private sector, because I do think that it's quite a critical insight um, into this issue. Um, and I do think that, and we've talked, Michael talked about it, and particularly the, the sectors that have been named within the Zondo Commission have really, you know, critical parts of, of kind of the ecosystem, banks, auditors, consulting. It's really shaken up um, the sectors, but also the private sector more broadly. And the resulting impact of that has been a nervousness. Um, and as Cass mentioned, a reflection within the private sector about, you know, what, what should we be doing to prevent this and what have we been doing to enable this? Many years ago, when we uh, would have the conversation with uh, companies within the NBI, there was a strong sense that corruption sat and was centered in the, in the public sector, and it was a waste of our energy and resources to focus on the private sector. And as you can imagine, that has changed substantially. Um, and I think part of that has caused us to take a very deep look and get deep insights into the private sector in relation to corruption. And I want to just share some of those insights um, because I do think it speaks to a much broader issue and, and a much broader challenge um, that we have, to, we have to address. We, um, we did a, the NBI did a comprehensive benchmarking study of JSE listed companies. We used publicly available information. We were interested in understanding how companies disclosed um, what they were doing in relation to corruption, but going beyond compliance. So we did look at aspects such as policies and, and mechanisms and systems in place to deal with these issues. But we were also very interested in going beyond that. And our theory was, you know, there is an enabling environment um, that is created when corruption can really manifest within organizations. So we were interested in things like organizational culture, values, diversity at a leadership level, um, interested in issues of discrimination, bias, bullying, sexual harassment, as we believe all of those things exist within an environment where corruption is able to take hold. Those insights within that benchmarking report were supported by a very deep comprehensive um, research study that we did and, uh, and we'll be releasing the, the findings, of, of findings of that in the next month or so that went into two organizations that have gone through um, corruption, uh, very public corruption issues. We did a series of focus groups and interviews with employees, with leadership to try and understand the more nuanced, the more complex issues that exist within companies, again, for corruption to manifest. And it supported those in initial insights that we had. Issues around power dynamics, hierarchical structures, informal systems, where decisions are made. Are they made in the boardroom or are they made at dinner or drinks outside of work? Organizational culture and very strongly emerged these themes of bullying, sexual harassment, gender discrimination, that all speak to that culture where corruption can thrive. So I think 
you know, what it reveals is that indeed what the Zonda Commission revealed was that indeed private sector is a, is a part of the problem and that the work that the private sector has to do is deep and it's complicated and it's encompassing of a whole lot of issues uh, that need to be addressed. But I suppose, you know, reflecting on maybe the, the silver lining of, of what, we, what we've gone through is that it has opened up the space for op uh, the opportunity for engagement with the private sector. Cass has talked about, um, you know, some of the things that BUSA is doing and engaging with its members about. And certainly from an NBI perspective, we've been doing this work for, for a while and looking at ways to seriously engage the private sector um, in these ways. And one of the critical things that we've noted is the opportunity for having those candid conversations and dialogues for other companies to learn and get, gain insight into what, what's gone wrong. Um, we've hosted a number of dialogues that have done this and we, we had one where EOH, uh, as an example, came to speak and share. And, and I think most people know that EOH has been quite candid about their issues around corruption and share their insights. Um, we're also, you know, speaking to this theme of accountability, launching the accountability talks, um, and we'll be launching the first one in November, which is with KPMG. Um, and it's a conversation with the, the CEO and the chairperson to really understand what, what happened, what, what went wrong, what are the insights, what are the learnings, and, and how can other organizations and companies learn from that? That's in addition to, to um, ethics training. Um, but I think the, the point about it is that we need to be looking at this very broadly. There are a number of, um, there are a number of sources of information that tell us um, what is going on within the private sector, not just in relation to state capture, um, that have far reaching consequences. Some of these are the ethics barometer from Gibbs the Transparency and Corporate Reporting Report that um, was released in partnership between Corruption Watch, ODI and NBI. These all give quite a detailed picture of where the private sector sits in relation to this. And so when we're thinking about what do we need to do to prevent this going forward, I think it's important that this is quite a holistic view um, and, and that we have an understanding of the kind of complexity that we're, we're dealing with within the space. There are a number of things that the, the private sector should be doing to create an ethical culture. And I think some of these include strong and bold leadership and leadership that is diverse. So transformation is a critical issue for us. And I think within this conversation is a critical issue. Obviously issues around strong governments that their policies are, gov are supported by effective mechanisms. And I think here, what's been highlighted um, already by, by CAS is around better protection for whistleblowers, a stronger focus on transparency and absolutely addressing workplace transformation and equity. Um, so these are all big issues and these are all challenging issues um, that the private sector has to address quite meaningfully. Um, and I think everybody in the room will be aware that this is also where the private sector has been uh, challenged. Um, and so the work that we do tries to, to take this approach. Um, and I think it's about, you know, a multifaceted, uh, cross-sectoral, uh, collaborative approach. But we know that, you know, the levels of trust within South African society are low. And certainly um, the Zondo Commission and the findings of the Zondo Commission have severely impacted our trust. Um, and so we're in a pretty tough space, um, but I think that there is, and we've seen certainly commitment from many companies within the private sector to deal with this. There is a recognition that corruption is not, um, is not benefiting uh, uh, in the long term that there might be short-term gains for certain people and individuals and groups within companies, but actually 
from a business perspective, the operating environment, the way of working, the level of infrastructure and service delivery has to be optimized and improved um, in order to, to do business better. And so while we see um, the issue of corruption within the private sector as quite a complex issue uh, that's multifaceted and, and, and there's a lot of work that needs to happen, I suppose we are um, bolstered by the fact that, you know, everything that we've been through and how, you know, the nation has been rocked um, by the insights, there is a greater interest, engagement and commitment to, to dealing with these issues. So those are my, my opening um, thoughts and comments, Tokozani, thank you. Thank you, uh, Google. And I think it's important to note that uh, the private sector operates within an enabling environment, as she said. So maybe state capture is almost, you know, normalized within this environment where all sorts of things take place. Kaya, your thoughts, please. <laughs> Good morning. Greed is good. Greed is good. Now that I've got your attention, the first uh, point uh, 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 of departure is that this conference, in my view, is exactly one day late. If this conference had happened yesterday, it would have been the 13th of September. And for those of you that remember the origins of this conversation, the 13th of September is the anniversary of the release of an essay by Milton Friedman in 1970. That essay was called The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. The relevance of that essay over the past 52 years has been this. Since that essay was published, what it did is that it resolved what had been regarded as an emerging tension that business leaders had to try and grapple with. And, and the question was, what exactly is the purpose of business? So what Friedman did with his essay is that he essentially unleashed capitalism in the form that we understand today. Because by him simply saying to every single executive out there that you've got a singular responsibility, which is to do whatever it takes to actually increase the bottom line, he essentially opened the floodgates of capitalism as we now know it. This was crystallized 17 years later in Hollywood, actually, in a movie called Wall Street. So the line, greed is good, actually comes from a movie called Wall Street. It's a line from Gordon Gecko. And what that movie was all about is that it essentially showed us how the world of capital markets in particular, the world of financial services works. So they had this very, very wonderful world. If you are young and you wanted to be a capitalist, it's a very appealing movie because they live, they live very lavishly and they live very well. But the essence of that movie was that whatever it takes for us to score the client, whatever it takes for us to outpace the competitor, it is fine. So he actually said greed is good. Why this is all particularly relevant is that obviously in capitalist structures as they've evolved over time, it's the one thing that we always promote in that competition is good. And competition in the way that we tend to measure it is not a question of how pretty your offices are. It's a question of how lucrative your company is as an investment destination. In other words, how profitable you are in comparison to the next person. So if it turns out, as Cascoveda mentioned earlier on, that the basis for me scoring that contract is to simply to be able to outbid you in one form or another. If it turns out that the bidding landscape, as it turns out, is actually compromised, the only way I can outbid you in that compromised landscape is to participate in that form of compromised bidding process myself. In fact, South Africans must always remember that when we talk about state capture in relation to private sector, I always try to take it a step back and say, wait, 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 hold on. Even before we talk about state capture in the private sector, let us crystallize what it is that we're trying to refer to here. We're still talking about the redirection of public resources toward private pockets. That's the essence of it. Whether you call it state capture or corruption, that is what we're trying to tackle here. And South Africa in particular should not fixate its analysis, its analysis of the private sector around the state capture years. Because remember many, many years ago, in um, it was a conference room in Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, Nelson Mandela was there, Denis Jordan was there, and Ivan Koza was there. And then you had this young short person called Sepp Blatter. And Sepp Blatter stands up and then he unleashes an envelope and then he says the winner is South Africa. And that's when we won the 2010 World Cup process. What emerged behind that is that about two years later, in December 2006, at another hotel room in Cape Town, there were seven um, CEOs and, and, and managing directors 
of the leading construction companies in the country at that point in time. They sat around the room and then they decided that, that look, the country has to build these uh, soccer stadiums across the country. And what we now know is that because these are going to be public procurement processes, Section 217 in particular of the Constitution has been written to say that, look, there must be a cost-effective and a competitive process. And in assessing the competitiveness of the process, the three of us are going to submit our bids, and whoever sits on the other side of the bid adjudication committee has to look at the merits of each of the proposal, and eventually the pricing is going to be a fundamental component of it. So the Constitution has this utopian view that in a normal state of affairs, that's what's going to happen. And of course, if the, be if the best of the three bids wins, then South Africa has won because we've got the best that we can get. So the three of us representing those seven construction companies then decided that, look, if we are going to ensure that we get the best out of this, in other words, the highest windfall, in other words, if you're going to live up to the Friedman philosophy of 1917, surely it is better for us to prepare all our bids and then figure out that, look, it turns out that the cost of doing this, the cost of selling this bottle of water is 100 Rand. However, what's wrong with us charging 150 Rand for it? So the only way you and I can show that we can charge 150 Rand for it is for the three of us to prepare our bids. And of course, our bids are going to say, look, at the best, the answer is 100. However, because the three of us have seen each other's bids, what I will then say is that, look, I will make my bid 120, yours must be 130, and yours must be 150. Because by the time David Lewis sits in the, as an adjudicator and looks at the three bids, he's like, dear God, Kaya is a maverick. He's only charging me 120. These two are trying to screw me over. 150, 170. Unbeknownst to him that the answer was never 120 to begin with. And that's how the essence of collusion worked. Right? So the fact that these construction companies did this as far back as 2006 simply means that the private sector has unfortunately, if we're going to think of state capture, they've predated the model. They mastered the model long before some of these clumsy idiots that we saw being paraded at the Zondo Commission, for example. The importance of this is the question of, well, now that we know that private sector actors are not immune to doing this, and private sector actors were not unleashed by Zuma into doing this thing, what is it that we need to do in order to actually confront them? And of course, we listened to Casco Vidya talking about what businesses are doing, and the fact that part of the problem is that being part of BUSA, for example, and being part of BLSA is still a voluntary exercise. So there's still a very weak accountability mechanism in relation to holding private sector players accountable. My departure point, however, with BUSA, and particularly with BLSA, is that whilst it may indeed be a voluntary participation, it appears that within those organizations themselves, the idea of accountability remains remarkably elusive. So the example that I always use is the example of KPMG and the example of Bain, in that at the point in time when there was a public hysteria talking about how those companies had conducted themselves, it was very easy for companies like, uh, for organizations like BLSA and BUSA to say, guys, you've embarrassed us, you need to get out of the room. Remarkably, and, and unbeknownst to everyone else, it seems that those companies found it very easy to convince everyone else within those structures that they had repented. And the reason I found that quite extraordinary is that it turns out that the parameter that these organizations apply for trying to figure out what the definition of accountability is actually much lower than what we know. It's much lower than what we, we even think the public sector ought to be about. So in the case of Bain, for example, there seems to have been the view taken by business leadership South Africa that if Bain has formed the view that they've repented, then Bain must have repented. There doesn't seem to be a very clear explanation of what it is that they assessed and then said, not only have they paid back the money if that's what they did, but more importantly, this is an organization that we're happy to be associated with. So what then happened is that once we then started asking questions from BLSA, it wasn't a matter of them reflecting on perhaps there's a disconnect between what we think has happened here versus what society understands here. No, BLSA's approach was to say that the rest of us were talking nonsense because we didn't know what Busima Vusu knew. So therefore, their response was simply to say that, look, guys, we've done our work. We know business better than you do. So it was a remarkably dismissive attitude. And in fact, the only way BLSA got out of the entanglement is that Bain itself seemed to have reached a meeting of the minds to say, look, this is becoming a bit too toxic. So Bain walked away. It wasn't business leadership that held Bain to account. It was business leadership that wanted to embrace Bain in spite of the fact that the rest of us were still asking questions. So earlier on, when um, Mr. Nombembe was talking, you know, and he, sp he spoke about the idea of greed, I was like, oh my God, we really should have had this conversation yesterday. 
because this idea of greed isn't necessarily a person who says that I'm the greatest human that ever lived. It's a person who feels that, look, I work for an organization that has to be a market leader, that has to, you know, win the best contracts out there. They don't see it as an element of greed. They see it as a matter of pursuing a competitive advantage. So when Michael talks about Deloitte in particular, what Deloitte did at ESCOM is that they felt they did whatever was necessary in order to score the contract. The fact that obviously the only way you can score contracts at ESCOM in that particular age is to essentially grease the palms of someone else was regarded as a necessary business practice because in their view, everyone else was doing it anyway. So suddenly, once we normalize the type of behavior, it no longer becomes an exceptional error. It simply becomes a business practice first and foremost. And I think Mr. Nomember was talking about some of those auditing principles that you know, when you talk about principles and procedures, if it turns out that the, world, the whole marketplace says that these are the boxes to be ticked and I'm ticking those boxes, I do not see myself as the one that's deviating from the standard practices. So therefore, I can't possibly be wrong. That is what the private sector does. And that's how the private sector behaves. And one of the interesting points that emerged from Cass's presentation was that there seemed to be this impression, I don't know if it was intentional, that in his view, or at least in the view of Business Unity South Africa, there is this um, conduit where government agents or government enablers go out and seek private sector collaborators in order to facilitate, uh, in order to facilitate corruption. In other words, business are simply the victims of compromised processes. I disagree with that principle. I really do think that businesses in particular have the latitude and have the capacity to, to define what they think are acceptable principles. And if you feel that the process that you're being invited to participate in doesn't meet up with those principles, you should have the courage, the moral courage to walk away from that particular tender. The fact that far too many of them do not seem to have the courage to walk away is a reflection of their poor ethical compass. It's not a reflection of how successful or how persuasive these dodgy government agents are, because I just don't believe that's the way that the things ought to be. So we need to be able to deal with the very difficult question, conundrum here that for as long as greed is the underwriting is an underwriting rider, if you want to call it that, underpinning capitalism, it is inevitable that everybody will simply try to learn the latest rules around the rules. So a few weeks ago, when Glencore was eventually held accountable, I was surprised because some of us wrote about it many years ago about what Glencore does. When the US Department of Justice finally decided to hold them accountable, the lesson there that the, 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 the business elite were taking were not the fact that Glencoe had done something wrong. All they learned from it was the fact that, oh, actually, these are the things that you shouldn't do in order not to get caught like Glencoe. So it wasn't a lesson of, no, these are the things that shouldn't be done. Because uh, particularly in the world of communities, everybody knows that you are not going to be able to get a license in Katanga in the DRC unless you have somebody like Dan Gettler in, in, in your back pocket. So people were not learning that Dan Gettler was a problem. They were learning that you need to find someone who does what he does, even if he has been displaced. So unfortunately, the private sector, being as pervasive and as influential as it is in the world of business, remains the epicenter of the redirecting of resources from the public press into the, into the private pockets. I'm happy to be persuaded otherwise, but unfortunately, it's unlikely to happen in a South African case study. <laughs> Thank you. So in summary, the bar is low. <laughs> OK, um, so um, just one last point. Mm -hmm. It would be amiss of me not to remark on the irony that I shared with Erin Bates just as I was walking up on stage here. And then obviously, this is a stage where we're trying to talk about matters relating to anti-corruption and all of these things. The building is named after Saul Kessner. <laughs> Sigh. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you to all our panelists. And um, I think now it's time for questions. So uh, let's take two questions from the floor to begin with. Are there any questions uh, from online? Two questions online, and then we'll come back to the floor. So yeah, I saw this hand first, that hand second, then we'll take the and then online, then the two here, I see one there and two there. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, is this an auction? <laughs> Can we start with the first two questions uh, in the front here, then online, then we'll get back to the floor. 
Sorry, what do you say? Okay. Um, you know, just a, a couple of points in response to the to the speakers. That I think that Michael is is right. That enablers has a very particular is a very particular term of art in 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 the corruption world, and it's not the person who it's not the firm that pays the bribe to get the contract. It's the auditing company that hides it, or the legal firm that writes the agreement, or the or the management firm that has advised on it, and they have a very very particular role. And um, the commission did not cover itself in glory in the way in which it dealt with it. You know, the one thing that dis really disappointed me in the commission, and I haven't read that section of the report, but I remember being in the commission on the day that evidence was was heard was the way in which they dealt with McKinsey. I mean, they, 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 they presented McKinsey as this paragon of good corporate practice because they had paid back their fee. I mean, you don't get to steal money and then get caught and say, well, I'll give back what it is that I stole. You get jailed and fined and all of those sorts of, uh, of, of good things. And in the case of a company like Bain, the amount of damage they caused relative to the fee in which they earned is incalculable uh, in what they did to, uh, to SARS. And so I don't think that those firms covered themselves in glory, but also law firms are particularly vulnerable here. You know, this notion that a company gets into trouble, and it could be a state-owned enterprise as well, gets into trouble, and their response is to bring in this white shoe, white shoe law firm that will then do an investigation. And it does the investigation, and it's never released publicly. When they have appealed to the public on the grounds that they are employing this firm, but when the firm says something, that they, when the, when the uh, investigating law firm says something that they don't like, suddenly it falls into the area of client confidentiality and the report doesn't get released. I think that that is absolutely, um, absolutely unacceptable. But I also wanted to say, I mean, I don't know how, Kaya never sees to amaze me, but I don't know how he worked out that the 30th of September is the anniversary of, of Milton Friedman's iconic essay. But I do, I, I, I recognize the poignancy of ha holding this uh, gathering in this building named after this person. And the, 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 the salience of it is that about 25 years ago, I don't know how many of you remember this, Saul Kersner bribed the Matanzimas and, a, and a, a, a cabinet minister named Stella Sitao, who was the daughter of a paramount chief of the, in, the, in the trans sky. Stella got 50,000 rand. The whistleblower was Bantu Holomisa in Mandela's cabinet, deputy minister in Mandela's cabinet. For his pains, he got removed from the cabinet, and I can't remember whether he was expelled from the ANC or he left the ANC. But so it started there. And you know, the notable thing about it, I mean, this was the only thing that Stella Sitar ever did that was at all memorable. But, uh, but, but the, except the amount that she used to eat, I remember. But, but, um, but it's interesting to see how the price has gone up. I mean, you would have to conclude from that that people who are selling corrupt services, like the Matanzimas and the Stella Sitars of this world, were, are operating in a seller's market because, you know, 50,000 Rand now, everybody would be embarrassed to accept a bribe. Uh, that's, that's small. But it is interesting that we are holding this uh, meeting in a room named after the first really significant corruption case. In, in democratic South Africa's history. And it all started about five years earlier in June 1992, Tabon Beg's 50th birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up on, on what Michael was talking about in terms of where to from here in terms of uh, deferred prosecution agreements, uh, settlement agreements and the like. 
an idea that has been raised recently by Iraj Abedian about a, a reparations fund, uh, looking at all of the, the private sector role players. Because as David says, you know, uh, paying back the, the fees that they earned is, 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 uh, is not enough because the damage that was done to institutions, SARS as an example, uh, goes way beyond that. And there needs to be some kind of, um, oh, the notion is that there should be some kind of reparations. There's a lot of data in the reports of the Zondo Commission that one can use and to get a body of people to, to calculate what those reparations might be in respect of each of the responsible entities. So just comments on that. Get uh, two questions from online, please. Okay, I'll be asking questions from the chat room. Uh, the first question is from Johan von Lochenberg. He says, the media falls under the private sector, albeit of a certain kind. Please comment on the dual roles of the media in respect to both exposing state capture and corruption, as well as being a victim that was infiltrated and manipulated to advance aspects of state capture. This question is intended to hopefully widen the notion of facilitators of state caption, corruption and fraud. The next question is from Feroz Kahlia. He says, Michael makes the interesting point that the complexity of cross-border fraudulent financial transactions may require settlement and deferred prosecutions. But we obviously can't have different standards for public and private sector criminals. So how do we square this circle? Would you like to respond to the last question and then maybe if you respond to the one on the media okay. you can go ahead uh, yeah, so thanks very much. I think several of those questions kind of touch on the same as touch on the same issue, particularly around settlements, deferred prosecutions. I mean, I think just on both those points, I fundamentally agree that one of the big gaps in the narrative so far is that we don't talk enough about uh, I think the term often in other places that's been used as social damage or social cost, and there have been some uses of that phrase around corruption cases in different parts of the world, Costa Rica and elsewhere, to try and uh, to, you know, to not sit back and say, well, this is impossible because it's too difficult to, to calculate, but say, actually, let's, let's start looking at this. Um, the repayment of fees um, is the base level, and then you should then proceed to be looking at debarment, which is one of the things I know we're introducing, well, people are talking about introducing legislative amendments. And then I think the idea of that, uh, that greater payment for reparations is, is vital. Um, and I suppose the, the question would then become around how there may be, there may be multiple payments in the sense that if there's a, if there's a criminal settlement, there might be a fine that would be then separate to the payment of a reparation in addition. And I think, that can that can only be a, a positive thing to to go as part of that to that second question the, the online question that for me is the more difficult one and that's why i said at the beginning um intuitively i am very skeptical and worried about deferred prosecutions for exactly that reason is that there is of course a risk that that becomes the go-to for corporate actors um but in a sense i suppose we face a problem in South Africa, as a lot of jurisdictions faces, we're trying to do two things at the same time, as we're trying to build the capacity of law enforcement to be able to take on those in, often incredibly complicated cases, um, while at the same time ha achieving some form of accountability now. Um, and so I think that the, there's an inevitable tension there that we're gonna have to pursue. The last thing I would say, this is not something that I raised or that's really come up so far, but that I think would certainly help with regard to the private actors is I'd want to see more proactive engagement with other jurisdictions from our law enforcement agencies. So for example, earlier this year, uh, the MPA finally listed uh, that full list of mutual legal assistance uh, requests both to and from. And it was fantastic that that was suddenly publicly accessible, but that was the first time we suddenly found out, oh, it's interesting, you know, on the PRASA matter, the Spanish authorities have already started coming to us for engagement. We found out recently that the German prosecutors are pursuing T systems. One of the hopes would be that in, in the scant resource issue that our law enforcement goes to the Germans and say, all right, well, let's work together. Because I mean, if you think you can get a, a criminal conviction of T systems there, let's share information, let's share evidence and do those. So that might be one of the ways I think in terms of bridging that gap and not creating that, that sense of a dual system 
of accountability. All right. Um, so the question about the media being infiltrated, one of the great omissions by the of the Zondo Commission is that in spite of the commitment that was made by the chair, that after getting some concurrence behind the scenes, he was going to publish the names of the affected and the implicated journalists, that was missing. So we still do not know who these journalists were. But also quite importantly, the idea that you know, media houses are infiltrated victims. Again, we need to be very cautious about trying to paint everyone who suddenly discovers that they are part of a corrupt enterprise as a victim of it. Because surely in the very basic tenets of ethical journalism, it is very clear to you how you should approach a story. It is very clear to you how you should treat um, sources. It is very clear to you how you should corroborate the data before publishing it. So anyone who then decides to compromise on those is firstly incompetent. However, one who then compromises on those on the basis of, of an exchange of fees and other gratuities, well, it's quite simply corrupt. So for me, you lose the ability to be painted as a victim once you gravitate away from being incompetent to being corrupt. Not everybody's going to be a good journalist. Some people are incompetent and you will let them be, but those that receive money in exchange are the problem. So I don't own a lot of cars. I don't know about you guys. I don't like cars in particular, but even if I did, I think I would keep track of who pays for the repairs in my car. That's just me. I don't know about the rest of you guys, <clears throat> right? So the question of department is a remarkably important one because unfortunately uh, we do operate in what you refer to as a very shallow market. And what makes our market shallow is that it's dominated by a few very key players and particularly in the auditing sector. And the view has always been that because it's so concentrated amongst the big four and the big five, the risk of losing one is that there is a, an overall market failure that transcends the simple issue that you're trying to resolve. So there's a lot of these companies that survive this on the basis that everybody says, well, actually they're too big to fail, which is why an organization like McKinsey, after all of this had happened, their new partner, uh, Kevin Sneeder, he came here to apologize and when he went back to his partners uh, back in the big offices in London and New York, the first thing they asked him is, what the fuck were you doing? And then they fired him. So the McKinsey partner who came to apologize to South Africa lost his job on the basis that his other partners just couldn't reconcile the fact we, as McKinsey, are apologizing to those random third world uh, uh, you know, people from Africa. It just didn't, it didn't make sense to them. So that department, that department is not going to happen. The last point um, relating to the question of reparations, Lawson, we've done this before. I mean, in 1996, we came up with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and you'd have thought that that was a one commission that was very clear about what we were trying to address and why there was a need for it. The social justice element was, was indisputable, and the commission is very clear that these are the individuals who are entitled to reparations, and the government then spent the next 25 years pretending the report never existed. Thank you. Um, Kaya, I, I don't know where to start, but I heard you mention Milton Friedman. I thought I would want to sound intelligent also and belong, and maybe quote my own, quote my own uh, philosopher, Cam Kruna of the 20th century. You uh, used to wear baggy pants and going by the name MC Hammer. <laughs> and you coined a phrase in a song, I think, uh, too legit to quit. And for a while, I think that sounded to be the mantra around which business uh, operated. Well, at least to the un to the to the to the to the to the to the, to the um, uninitiated like us. Until 2008 hit Wall Street, and we know that too big to fail was was the mantra became the mantra at least openly. And. It is very sad when you find a government such as ours pleading poverty to go over after the big, the big guys. Take, for example, Steinhoff. For me, for the life of me, I couldn't understand why the NPA would say, we're out of money, we can't do an investigation. You, the potential target of this investigation, we're okay if you give us some money. And yet you can buy a flag for 20 bars. Okay, maybe the flag has got some educational value of sorts, especially at light, it lights and stuff like that. But all it points to is that our priorities are skewed. We don't prioritize that which is important. And we should go to instill confidence in the state's ability to go after wrongdoers. And we say, at any rate, we'll pursue you 
we've got unlimited resources, will prosecute any crime that has got a prospect of being litigated successfully. And in the instance of Steinhoff, I'm not an accountant, maybe you can you know, shed some light, but for all intents and purposes, it appears that there was a case to be answered if other jurisdictions were able to pursue it. I think it was the Netherlands or somewhere in, the, in, the, in Europe where they were able to pursue Steinhoff. But we failed to do that. It's embarrassing that we've got two systems being pursued in Germany when this thing all started here. We had recently reports of uh, Zitlenko paying some money in South, South America. Um, I think even, even, even um, Bain paid some huge fine, I can't remember exactly for what, as, you know. But we fit all these crimes, they start here. But we say, no, we don't have money uh, to, to prosecute that. For me, that is the saddest thing that any government could ever say, or the mess in terms of messaging to say, we are so powerless and hopeless that we won't go for the big guys. But we will go for the smallest guy for whatever is left uh, in their bank account and will, will make life miserable for them. Even if it means spending 100 million to go and recover 2 million, we will do it. Uh, and it's maybe you might want to comment on that. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, Sharice from GIZ. <laughs> um, I think my question is just about uh, how can we protect uh, companies that are whistleblowers? So I think that's something that came up in some Gibbs research that was done in SMMEs who can often be the canary in the cold mine for bigger players and contracts, especially when it comes to procurement. And uh, what they found is that um, the, the, these SMMEs might be able to, to detect that there's corruption happening, but if they actually report it, they're not uh, protected and they subsequently lose out on other business opportunities. So my question is just how can we um, you know, a better protect them, given that the legislative regime um, obviously is not is not able to do that. So, let's take one last question from the floor. <laughs> we are going to run over time. Thank you. My question is for Cass, and it's on the issue of money laundering and the suspicious transactions. When you go into the body of the report, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, and it's almost like a non-finding in the report about where the problem lies between um, the FIC, either not acting on suspicious uh, transaction reports or the banks not reporting this. Given the systemic failures and the systemic role that banks played in money laundering, my question to Cass is, is, has there been a reckoning within the banking sector in South Africa about the role that they've played following the findings and non-findings of the commission? And is there anything proactively happening in the banking sector in terms of addressing their role uh, to reform the system to ensure that these kind of systemic money laundering doesn't continue to facilitate corruption going forward? Thanks. Okay, so... Um, I think that question is directed to Cass. I think Gugu can answer uh, the question before that. Um, can I just check that we're okay to take two last questions here? Kaya says it's all right if we fast. <laughs> yeah. So lunch will be a bit late. Okay, max five minutes. So please may we go to Cass and Gugu and then we'll come to the last two questions here. Okay, thanks. Uh Question on the banks. I, I obviously, I'm not at the banking association anymore, so I, I don't have information on all the banks. But immediately after the release of the Zondo reports, uh, we did, as Busa, uh, speak to banks mentioned. Uh, so uh, those banks actually came to see myself and the Busa president and deputy president. Uh, because we wanted to hear what they had to say about us. And the one thing that was raised, and I think one of the speakers raised this earlier, uh, is that the, the Zondo Commission 
according to the report, did not have time to actually call the banks to the commission and, and question the banks on what the conduct was. Uh, they also took us through in detail what they did and what sort of information they gave to the London Commission and that they are actually not just uh, that they've certainly seen the Zondo Commission report as a uh, an opportunity for them to actually tighten up some of what systems that they have to tighten, they need to tighten up to avoid what happened in instances where there was a system issue, but if it's in, in instances where uh, employees in banks were culpable, well, then that's what Londo says needs to be investigated and prosecuted. Uh, I think that as far as money laundering is concerned, and that's a critical issue at the moment because of the threat of the gray listing, uh, certainly from when I was at Barca, my experience was that a uh, significant amount of reporting was going into the FIC office. And, and uh, the FIC office was processing as much as it could. I think where the, 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 the sort of blockage comes in is more in the sort of criminal justice system than, than in the FIC office. Uh, the Saab and the FIC office are also very uh, diligent, in my view, in, in keeping tabs on banks as far as they have the system in place to detect money laundering activity. And you'll have seen recently, I think NetBank was fined for uh, a weakness in, in some of their systems. Uh, so, so I think banks are dealing with some of these issues. I think they have seen the Zondo report as uh, a wake-up call on some of these issues, and certainly from the banks that briefed us after the Zondo report was released, uh, uh, we had some detail on what they're doing. Thanks. Okay, uh, Google your response on um, whistleblowers in SMMEs, please. Thank you so much, uh, Togozani, and thank you for that question. When I spoke earlier about um, kind of the broader impact of the private sector corruption, um, one of these is, 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 is around SMEs. And this report that Gibbs um, shared did um, shed a number of insights that I think were incredibly enlightening. If we think about our big challenges around transformation, around economic inclusion, we know that the, the barriers to entry for SMEs are significant and, and that has to be a focus area. What this report revealed is that SMEs really struggle to navigate with large companies because they, uh, you know, they're put in very compromising, unethical situations. And as small players wanting to access broader supply chains, it becomes a really tough, uh, tough area. So it's certainly a, a gap. From an MBI perspective, we are doing some work around ethical supplier and thinking through how we can capacitate SMEs within the space, in addition to the work that we do with larger companies as well. But in terms of the whistleblowing aspect, I do think that this is a gap and something that does need to be addressed. I'm not aware of anything that currently exists to facilitate that. Um, and I think that it speaks to a broader um, gap and a, a broader need um, when it comes to whistleblowers, because you can imagine um, an SME going against a large corporate, um, you know, considering the implications of that are significant. So I think there is some work happening in this space but I definitely feel that this is something that does need to be taken seriously. And those insights that were shared in the report um, will hopefully galvanize some action in addressing that. Thank you, Toko. Thank you. So last two questions. Um, you'll start and then the person in front of you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Fatima from the Wraith Foundation. So I want to start off by supporting Michael that we remove that question mark from the panel name. And then I want to go further. I want to argue that the notion of private sector as enablers is still too generous because it costs them as a benign support actor in, in, a, in, a, in a complex where they are actually one of the two main protagonists. So I think for BUSA, we know that 
voluntary codes don't do a lot. It's symbolic. And that what Sondo Commission has done is they've presented the business community in South Africa with a moment for them to say what they're going to do proactively. If we assume the default of business is to maximize profit at all costs, and that's not an unreasonable assumption and not limited to South Africa either, then business must come to the party of a post-apartheid political project and show us what they're going to do, uh, what they didn't do at the TRC to start off with, and now at the Zondo Commission neither. So voluntary business and codes are not enough, and I think the few companies whose names we've heard in the Zondo Commissions are not aberrations. These are representatives of a system, um, and unless business South Africa comes to us and show us that they're going to take seriously the cleanup of the sector as much as is possible, I, it's very difficult to take them serious that we're in a post-apartheid project together, because the reality is the post-apartheid era has been very generous to South African capital. They've done very well. I think some of them are kicking themselves for resisting the end of apartheid. So voluntary business codes doesn't cut it. It's not enough, not for this critical moment that we're in. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Robin Foley from Center for Sustainability Transitions. Um, I think I've really enjoyed all of the inputs and I agree with a lot of what all of the speakers have said across the board. Um, I just sort of want to ask questions with regards to um, firstly how we're framing the discussion and the, I appreciate the acknowledgement that both private sector and public sector are effectively two sides of the same coin when it comes to state capture so they are not disconnected and they cannot be um, separated from that perspective. Um, I think one of the one of my main questions is around governments, or not government, sorry, the private sector's ability to hold themselves accountable and what are the potential mechanisms by which that can be done, um, particularly when it comes to holding individuals accountable. Because I think what we've seen is that corporates effectively fire the individuals that are busy colluding within these payments, but they're not actually being then held accountable ultimately. So from a private sector perspective, um, how does the private sector actually hold those individuals accountable themselves outside of legal frameworks or the law enforcement agencies? Um, the other part that I want to sort of question is what is the importance of private sector transparency and if maybe that's something that we should be calling for greater um, legislative changes or changes in the way in which business understands itself and the private sector understands itself in terms of its responsibility to be transparent and in this regard i'm just thinking in terms of beneficial ownership of companies so getting more down to the level of how do we actually, how, are, how is the private sector designed to enable corruption and exploitative practices? Um, and then lastly, it's the, sorry. <laughs> no, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Michael. So I'll just I'll try and tackle two things. I think the one is this uh, question, Robin, you know, the, the truthful answer is that I have very little faith in the ability of the private sector to kind of either hold themselves to account or hold their own to account. And one of the reasons links to the second point that you've raised is that if we look at the if we look at the general approach of the private sector to legislative reform, it is to try and water it down as much as is possible. We, Open Secrets, took part in the discussions around strengthening the Audit Profession Amendment Act, and the big four audit firms essentially only pitched up to say how unfair it was that Erbo would get more investigative powers and greater sanctions because it was going to make it harder for the industry. You've already seen parts of organized business come out with huge concerns around the beneficial ownership registry, etc. Not to say, of course, that they won't have genuine concerns, but I think the general approach across the globe is to try and undermine efforts 
for accountability. And what I would say in addition to that is just to say that it's it's almost in a sense with the repayment of fees is that we should just, any repayment of fees or companies firing their own people is completely separate to independent investigations. And we should just see that as such, I don't think we should praise anyone for firing people for being involved in corruption or for, or again, you know, for the repayment of fees. It's kind of a base level and then we proceed to, um, or we proceed to to the investigative stage um, and then just very very briefly Krum, i know it wasn't directed to me but i wanted to make the observation about the banks which i think is so interesting of course is that all that we've discussed a lot about where the fault came whether it was the banks reporting the fic or law enforcement what was obviously interesting is that all the banks went to the zondo commission and vehemently defended their right to stop transactions and close down relationships independently of what law enforcement did if they felt that there was a significant risk. And they did it and they continue to do it. And it's in that context that we should have been asking them the questions. And NetBank's a great example. They stopped banking Gupta accounts but continued to bank with Baroda long after it was publicly known that Baroda was essentially a Gupta bank in this country. And so it's not just the question of where in the, the ecosystem the failure is, it's also just that hard question to the bank about like, well, at, at what point did you know? And then at what point did you make the decision that it was, you know, it was too far gone for you to be involved with? Hey. Can you break our fast with your final comment? Yes, um, I think the one question that was raised around the, the property or the integrity of Stanhoff essentially financing its own investigation. So that obviously creates a lot of tension points, um, particularly if it turns out that the NPA comes out and says that Stanhoff is innocent because a lot of people will not take that process seriously. So it's obviously reflective of just how poorly we invested in our law enforcement systems. And I think that's the one thing that we need to get right. So I strongly oppose the idea of anyone financing an investigation into their own self. In fact, I oppose it whenever it happens when a company says we've commissioned an, our, an independent investigation into ourselves because well one thing that capitalism has got completely wrong is the the business model for public interest issues so when you talk about how auditors pay their own clients how rating agents are paid by their own people they're trying to rate and how these law firms do independent investigations in exchange for a fee to be paid by the uh, the, the subject of the investigation that business model is the definition of conflict and compromise and until we find an alternative business business model we're never going to get very far are we Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you for your patience. I hope you enjoyed the rigorous discussion. Lunch is ready and uh, we'll see you afterwards.